there isn't any question that Islamic law allows for sex with slaves and that women who are taken in war, in jihad, um, can legally be used as sex slaves. Um, can legally be used as sex slaves. be used as sex slaves. Uh, in Exodus, God bestows uh, upon us the rules for selling your daughter as a sex slave. Uh, this is the law as approved by God. If he's going to be consistent... He When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she will not be freed at the end of six years, as men are. If she does not please the man who bought her, he may allow her to be bought back again, but he is not allowed to sell her to foreigners, since he is the one who broke the contract with her. And if the slave girl's owner arranges for her to marry his son, he may no longer treat her as a slave girl, but he must treat her as a daughter. If he himself marries her and then takes another wife, he may not reduce her food or clothing or fail to sleep with her as his wife. If he fails in any of these three ways, she may leave as a free woman without making any payment. If he's going to be consistent, he just needs to just, just move on along. Throughout the Old Testament, the issue of concubines is talked about 36 times. 36 times you find concubines in the Old Testament. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 13, it says, Meanwhile, David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem. Both Matthew and Luke provide genealogies of Jesus Christ with the intent to establish the Savior as a descendant of David, and thus the legal heir to the throne of the Kingdom of Israel. Both genealogies follow radically different lines from David to Jesus and are problematic in providing a legitimate claim to the throne. Whatever the specific lineage may have been, one thing is certain. The Jews of his time, both friend and foe, universally acknowledged Jesus Christ as a descendant of David. If he's going to be consistent, if he's going to be consistent, Okay, here's the question. What is the deal with concubines? Have you ever heard about concubines? We'll talk about what they are. So what was a concubine? A concubine was a woman without a husband. A concubine was a woman without a husband. What she would do is bind herself to a man to make sure she was provided for. She was not his wife. She was not his wife. And while in many respects she shared a relationship with the man like a wife would, the purpose of this relationship was her future.
And as crude and as off-putting as this is for us today, uh, for the time and the culture, it was really an advanced system of care. They essentially came up with retirement plans 4,000 years before there was a 401k, Social Security, or nursing home. And, and for what many people call a male-dominated society, they certainly made sure women were taken care of. Historically, concubinage was mainly a voluntary choice of the woman. There isn't any question that Islamic law allows for sex with slaves and that women who are taken in war, in jihad, um, can legally be used as sex slaves. That's the Sharia. Now that Sharia comes from the seventh century in Arabia but once you make that normative for all of mankind in all ways, and it's based upon a, a culture of military conquest, well, then there you go. Um, what are you going to do about that? Especially since the, the concept is, well, the, the final revelations in the Quran override anything before that. And the problem is the final revelations of Quran in the Quran come from the very period of time when Muhammad has reached the height of his power as prophet, as general of the Islamic armies. And so once again, it, what it illustrates for us is the vast difference between the Christian scriptures and the Islamic scriptures in the provision of a meaningful context and the reality of the fact that Christianity can cross all cultural and temporal boundaries, whereas Islam has to, in essence, attempt to uh, uh, erase those boundaries and create a, uh, an Islamic caliphate everywhere. So there you go. Fifthly, we can say that of the uh, interesting things of our law is that it created a legal framework that incorporates treatment of riqs and amas, but it doesn't require their existence. So if we eliminate the whole institution of abs and amas, the Islamic Sharia is still valid and intact. There is no legislation that requires an, an abd. Don't, there's no legislation that requires the existence of this institution and therefore in our times when there is no such institution as slavery, Islamic law is full and valid and it doesn't need their existence. And this is an amazing point in my opinion that clearly demonstrates that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, intended for this institution to be something that is not necessary and required. If it's there, there are laws that governed it for 11, 12 centuries. Now that it's gone, we don't need those institutions don't need to be brought back. And that's why I don't know of any scholar in our times that is calling for uh, this institution to come back. We can't really get into, but I thought I'd mention it. Uh, the um, the uh, our, a number of articles hit today. Islamic State Offering Sex Slaves as Prizes in Quran Reciting Contests. Now, once again, my, my Western Muslim friends uh, will look at this and will roll their eyes and say, how horrible, how non-Islamic, you shouldn't raise these issues. This doesn't represent Islam. But to be honest and honest with the history of that is recorded in the Hadith, in the Sunnah of the Prophet, as you all would put it, is this really non-Islamic? I mean, um, I know there's one Hadith. It's repeated dozens of times between Bukhari and Muslim. I'm not sure if it's in Abu Dawood and so on and so forth, but it's, it's in both Bukhari and Muslim. Where Muhammad gave a woman 
to a man. Now, she had offered herself in marriage to Muhammad, and he had refused. But he gave her in marriage to a very poor man in return for memorization of the Quran. And I, like I said, this is actually the story that I've used as an illustration of how the way that I read the Hadith, which was recording them into MP3 from text. So there's no way to there's no way to skip anything. So when when you're reading a book and you come across the same story you've already read 13 times before, you can just skip over it and move to the next one. Talk to a Muslim and I let them know that I've read the Quran multiple times, that I've actually translated portions of the Quran from Arabic in Arabic, and that I have read Sahih Bukhari, almost finished with Sahih Muslim, the Muwatta of Malik, all the Hadith Qudsi. Uh, that about at that point their jaws drop open because most of them have never done anything even close to that. Most of their imams have not done that much reading. Um, and so they're just like, You're kidding me. Um, and that you're kidding me. Is every cab ride I have taken recently has had a Muslim cabbie. Mm -hmm. And we have had fascinating conversations because I am able to narrate the Islamic Hadith. And they've never met a Christian that could narrate to them the way their imams narrate to them from the Hadith. You're kidding me. You're kidding me. I am able to narrate the Islamic Hadith. And they've never met a Christian that could narrate to them the way their imams narrate to them from the Hadith. You're kidding me. You can't do that when it's recorded via MP3. Um, my my iPod is in my jersey. I can't reach back there to play around with it. You just got to listen to it again. And so, I mean, I I'm not trying to exaggerate to say that I think I heard that story minimally 35 as many as 45 times. It is repeated that often. So you have precedent in the Hadith for the giving of a woman in marriage by Muhammad based upon memorization of a portion of the Quran. If he's going to be consistent, he just needs to just, just move on along. Short answer, yes. Long answer, yes.